So let's talk about how to apply quality peer-reviewed science to your day and how to optimize everything from sleep to learning, creativity, meal timing, etc. The first thing I do after I wake up is I take the pen that's on my nightstand and the pad of paper on my nightstand and I write down the time in which I woke up. The reason for writing down what time I wake up is because I want to know that average wake up time. That average wake up time informs what's called my temperature minimum. It tells me when my body temperature was lowest. I know that the lowest temperature that my body will be at across the 24 hour cycle tends to be two hours before my typical wake up time. And I want to know that number. It's called our temperature minimum. So I highly recommend that you write down when you wake up or track that in some way that works for you and use that as a reference point to determine your temperature minimum. We will return to the temperature minimum and how you can leverage the temperature minimum for several things, shifting your clock, shifting your circadian sleep schedule and wake schedule, also for shifting your eating schedule, et cetera. The second thing I do after I wake up is to get into forward ambulation, which is just nerd speak for taking a walk. When we generate our own forward motion, forward ambulation, visual images pass by us on our eyes, so-called optic flow. The effect it has is essentially to quiet or reduce the amount of neural activity in this brain structure called the amygdala. There are now at least half a dozen quality papers published in quality peer-reviewed journals that show that forward ambulation, walking or biking or running, and generating optic flow in particular has this incredible property of lowering activity in the amygdala and thereby reducing levels of anxiety. Getting sunlight in your eyes first thing in the morning is absolutely vital to mental and physical health. It is perhaps the most important thing that any and all of us can and should do in order to promote metabolic well-being, promote the positive functioning of your hormone system, get your mental health steering in the right direction. There are a number of reasons for this. The protocol is get outdoors, ideally with no sunglasses if you can do that safely. How long should you do this? It's going to depend on the brightness of the environment. It's going to depend on a number of different factors. Minutes would be a minimum. 10 minutes would be even better. And if you can, 30 minutes would be fantastic. Basically ensure that you're getting adequate stimulation of these neurons in the eye that are called the melanopsin intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells. I know that's a mouthful. These are neurons that convey to the brain that it's daytime and it's time to be alert. And it sets in motion a huge number of biological cascades within every cell and organ of your body, from your liver to your gut, to your heart, to your brain. It really sets things down the right path. You don't want to stare directly at the sun or any light that's so bright that it feels painful. If, it's, if you feel like you have to close your eyes or blink, please do. You don't want to damage your retinas. The point here is to get the sunlight indirectly. It's going to essentially be scattered everywhere through the cloud cover. Do your best to do this every day. If you miss a day, no big deal, but try not to miss more than one day. Otherwise, your mental and physical health will start to suffer. I purposely delay my caffeine intake to 90 minutes to 120 minutes after I wake up. The reason for delaying caffeine intake 90 minutes to two hours after waking is I want to make sure that I don't have a late afternoon or even early afternoon crash from caffeine. It took me years to figure this out. I used to wake up and I'd think, oh, I don't want to drink caffeine too close to bedtime, so I'm going to start drinking my caffeine really early. I let my cortisol naturally come up in the morning. I avoid drinking caffeine until about 90 minutes or two hours after waking. And when I do that, I find that I don't experience the afternoon crash. My primary objective early in the day is to get into a mode of being focused yet alert so that I can get work done. I found that the best way for me to achieve that state is through fasting. So I don't eat anything until about 11 a.m. or 12 noon. Let's talk about why fasting works to create this heightened state of alertness yet calm brain state. Fasting increases levels of adrenaline, also called epinephrine in the brain and body. Our levels of epinephrine and adrenaline are increased. We learn better. We can focus better. There's terrific data supporting that. In its optimal range, adrenaline really provides a heightened sense of focus and the ability to encode, meaning bring in and retain, remember information. So 
we're now at the description of my day and these protocols in which I would do a 90 minute bout of work. Now, why 90 minutes? Well, the brain is going through these 90 minutes, so-called ultradian cycles throughout the entire day and night. Every 90 minutes, we shift over from being very alert to being less alert and then back to alert again. Here's how it works. At the start of one of these 90 minute ultradian cycles, my brain is not quite engaged in whatever it is I'm trying to do. Now, oftentimes I have things jumping into my mind. I've got distractions, etc. But I set a timer for 90 minutes and I try and get a strong bout of work done inside of that 90 minutes with the full understanding that the entire 90 minutes is not going to be uniform in terms of my ability to focus. There will be kind of peaks and valleys within that, but that 90 minutes is about what the brain can handle in terms of a dedicated effort for high degree of focus. So how do you increase that focus and how do you use the, the timer feature? Well, you can combine those. I use a program called Freedom. It shuts me out of the internet completely. So that means no checking the markets, no checking social media, no checking uh, you know, the, the news, no checking email, none of that. I get a dedicated bout of work done. So the goal is to get into what I call the tunnel, to really get into a tunnel of quality work. The brain loves that state, but it's very hard for many of us to access. There's a powerful way in which you can place the timing of this 90 minute work bout in an optimal way. You have access to a very important piece of data that dictates when this bout should start more or less and when it should end. That piece of data is your temperature minimum. If you're somebody who wakes up on average at 7 a.m., well, then your temperature minimum is 5 a.m. And you can be reasonably sure that your best work is going to be done anywhere from four to six hours after your temperature minimum. So for me, I tend to wake up around 6.30 a.m. That means my temperature minimum is at 4.30 a.m. You can add five hours to that. So that means that a 90-minute work bout could fall at 9.30 a.m. and it would be fairly optimized. Or I could do it at 10.30 a.m., or I could do it at 8.30 a.m., somewhere in there. So again, just to be clear, it's a 90-minute work bout. That's about what the brain can handle for a very intense work bout. But when to place that 90-minute work bout, when to start it and when to end it will depend on that temperature minimum. So if you're somebody who wakes up at 8 a.m. each morning, your temperature minimum is 6 a.m., chances are you're going to want to start this work bout somewhere around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. So after I've finished a bout of work, this 90 minute bout of work, I force myself to do some sort of physical exercise that is going to be supportive of my brain health and brain function and organ health and bodily function in general. So I just briefly want to touch on what the structure of that exercise looks like. There are various forms of physical activity or what we call exercise, but those can generally be batched into two categories. First is strength and hypertrophy work. So physical movements that are designed to make you stronger and or make your muscles larger. There's also endurance work. Physical exercise and movements that are designed to allow you to do more work over time or to extend the amount of time that you can do work. The basic design of this physical exercise is that it be approximately 60 minutes. So maybe 60 plus or minus 15 minutes. And essentially what the data tell us is that in order to optimize cardiovascular and brain health and other systems of the body, we want to exercise at least five days per week. But essentially the structure of the exercise regimen that works for sake of supporting health is going to be one in which there's a three to two ratio, where for a 12 week period or so, maybe 10 to 12 weeks, Three of those five workouts per week emphasize strength and hypertrophy, and the other two emphasize endurance. Then after 10 or 12 weeks, one switches over to a 10 or 12 week regimen of doing a three to two ratio where you're prioritizing endurance work. And there are a lot of data now supporting the fact that maintaining muscular health and bone health is supported by resistance training, weight training of various kinds. It can also be done with body weight if you don't have access to equipment. And of course, that doing cardiovascular endurance work is very beneficial both to the muscles of the body, the organs of the body, but also to the brain. 
One of the most common questions I get are, what should I eat for my brain? Well, um, ironically enough, uh, one of the best things you can do for your brain is to not eat. But of course, we all have to eat sooner or later. And eating is wonderful. I absolutely love eating. I even enjoy the mere act of chewing. So for lunch, I do emphasize slightly lower carbohydrate or low carbohydrate intake for the simple reason that adrenaline and dopamine and their associated neuromodulators are going to support alertness. So for me, I fast up until about noon. Then I eat a lunch that consists of some sort of protein thing, like a, some meat or some chicken or some salmon and some vegetables, etc. And if I've exercised previously, then I will ingest some starches. I'll ingest some red or br- bread, excuse me, or rice or oatmeal and butter and nuts and things like that. I will consume the various food groups, as they say, but I will keep the total amount of carbohydrate a little bit on the low side, or if I haven't trained, I won't have any carbohydrate at all. And so for me, eating a noon-ish meal that is not enormous, but is decent in size, but that is mainly protein, healthy fats, and low-ish carbohydrates or no carbohydrates is what allows me to achieve heightened states of alertness throughout the day, which is what I need for my purposes. Now, what about components of foods that are not about alertness, but are about mood? We did an entire episode on mood and food, and it's very clear based on now dozens of studies that ingesting sufficient levels of omega-3 fatty acids is going to support healthy mood and even can act as an antidepressant. More than a dozen studies have shown that ingesting at least 1,000 milligrams per day of the EPA form of essential fatty acid is as effective as prescription antidepressants in relieving depression. Most people are not ingesting sufficient levels of omega-3s. And I'm certainly one of those people. Despite an effort to eat good foods and whole foods, et cetera, and unprocessed foods, I've made the choice to ingest at least 1,000 milligrams per day of EPA. I do that in the form of fish oil and EPA, DHA uh, combination fish oil. But the, but the threshold of 1,000 milligrams is not 1,000 milligrams of fish oil. It's 1,000 milligrams of EPA. Along the lines of hormones and testosterone, I get a lot of questions about this, I think, because a lot of online communities are sort of obsessed with testosterone. And I just want to emphasize that, yes, having sufficient levels of testosterone is vitally important for brain function and having sufficient levels of estrogen will allow your brain to actually function. It turns out that estrogen is one of the main ways in which the brain maintains longevity and maintains its ability to think. So we should all be seeking optimal testosterone levels for ourselves, both testosterone and estrogen. And many of the things that we've discussed up until now, morning sunlight, exercise, fasting, those can support testosterone and estrogen in meaningful and positive ways. For those that have lower than desired levels of testosterone, it turns out that 400 milligrams per day of something called Tongat Ali, which is a form of ginseng, can actually help increase levels of free testosterone. Many people experience a positive subjective effect and some objective effects as well, meaning increases in free testosterone when they do blood analysis. The other compound that's relevant both to men and women, or I should say people that are trying to optimize testosterone and or estrogen is Fidogia. Fidogia agrestis is a actually an herb that increases the levels of what's called luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is a hormone that's released from the hypothalamus within the brain that travels to the gonads, either the ovaries or the testes to stimulate the release of estrogen or testosterone. And Fidogia agrestis has been shown, albeit in a limited number of studies, to increase levels of luteinizing hormone and thereby levels of testosterone and estrogen in ways that uh, some people find beneficial. So at some point in the evening, I eat that thing that we call dinner. Dinner generally is comprised of things that are going to support rest and deep sleep. And that means starchy carbohydrates. It's absolutely clear that one of the major ways that we can increase Serotonin, which helps in the transition to sleep, is by ingesting starchy carbohydrates. So my dinner is carbohydrates and some protein. So maybe some chicken or fish or something like that, maybe some eggs, or sometimes just pasta or just rice and vegetables. And that's because I enjoy those foods, but also because I want to increase the amount of serotonin in my brain so that I can actually fall asleep that night. Many people who are on low carbohydrate diets struggle with falling and staying asleep. 
And that's because it's hard to achieve heightened levels of serotonin, which are necessary to enter sleep. And because I'm doing some physical training and presumably you are as well, or I hope you are because it's so beneficial to one's health, that's also going to replenish my glycogen stores, which is the one of the primary fuel sources for moving one's muscles and moving around and doing exercise, as well as for the brain and for cognitive function. For me, and I do believe for most people, creating a situation of maybe fasting and then low carb or no carb diets for states of alertness and focus at one portion of the day, and then ingesting starchy carbohydrates for sake of inducing rest and relaxation is a at least scientifically rationally based protocol. It's grounded in real neurochemistry. It's grounded in things that we can point to and say, ah, this food substance, this thing can support my brain, not directly because it's some magic substance that's going to make all my neurons uh, you know, extremely robust, but rather it's going to support sleep, which is perhaps the foundation of all mental and physical health. In fact, we can point to sleep as the primary way in which we can ensure our overall health, including our brain health.